Welcome to the Highway Church of Christ in Benton, Arkansas. Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see everybody that's here today. It's another wonderful day that we get to enjoy this life's blessings and that we get to hand in hand anticipate the return of eternal life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. For those who are visiting, we welcome you and we pray that your time with us today will be encouraging. We are especially excited and eager to have any that are here that are not members of the Lord's Church. Because we want you to be able to hear what we have heard. We want you to be able to know what we know. Amen. And we want you to enjoy what we now enjoy as New Testament Christians. If you will open your Bibles with me to the book of John, it's a passage of scripture that we learned from our childhood. While you're turning there, it's the book of John, chapter 3. We're going to focus our attention this morning on verse 16. I want to give you a little bit of context of what's happening here. Our Lord has been approached by a Pharisee, by a Jewish teacher named Nicodemus. There's all sorts of speculation as to why he came to him by night, but the Bible doesn't record that for us. And so it really does not matter why he came by night, but we know that he was there and he spoke with our Lord. Jesus cut straight to the point of the conversation when Nicodemus approaches him and he talks to him about his teaching and his works that he had seen. And Jesus cuts straight to the matter and starts to talk to him about this new birth. Now the focus of the sermon necessarily isn't about the new birth, but more than the conditions that Jesus places thereon. And that whole of the rest of chapter 3 talks about this new birth. And we're going to give our focus to chapter 3, verse 16 this morning. What is often called the golden text of the Bible. And again, many of us have learned this from our childhoods. If you'd like, let's look at this together. If you have your copy of God's Word this morning, let's look at John chapter 3. We'll begin the reading, <clears throat> excuse me, up just a little bit higher. Uh, then verse 16, that way we can catch uh, a little bit of the immediate context. Let's start at verse 14. John chapter 3, verse 14 beginning. Jesus says, And as Moses lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so, or in the same way, must the Son of Man be lifted up, that whosoever believed in him should not perish, but have eternal life. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son that whosoever believes in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. For God sent his Son into the world, or God sent rather not his Son into the world to condemn the world, but through uh, that the world through him might be saved. Jesus started this, or we pick up rather this, this conversation where Jesus draws Nicodemus' attention all the way back to something that happened in the book of Exodus. Or Numbers, rather. In Numbers chapter 21, we're beginning around verses 4, going through verse 9 in there. The children of Israel had gotten a little impatient with God. They got a little bit impatient with Moses. They start to murmur. They start to complain as they often did. And as people often do. The journey got challenging for them as they were traveling, going to this land of promise. They had been told about the flow with milk and honey. They would enjoy these wonderful blessings. But the way, the Bible says, became challenging for them, and they start to disobey God. They challenged Moses, and so God, after he'd been patient with them, he'd been patient with him, with them, he sent serpents into the group of people, and many of the people were bitten by what are called fiery serpents, what we would call venomous snakes. People start to get ill and even die. And so God said, if you want to live, Moses, I want you to take and make this brazen serpent, and I want you to fashion this, this, this metal into a serpent shape, put it on top of a pole, and lift it up high. And those people who want to get relief from their poison, their, their bite of death, if you will, they will cast their eyes and look on it. Now, it wasn't the making of the serpent that was going to save the people. It wasn't even the lifting of the serpent that was going to save the people. But when they looked on it, they would be saved. And Jesus made a correlation there. He says that in the same way, 
that they were bitten by the serpents, they had this curse of death, if you will, and they were going to die from these venomous snakes. He says, in the same way, I'm going to be lifted up. He says, and, and so must the Son of Man be lifted up, verse 14, and whosoever believes in him should not perish. In the same way they had to look on the serpent, they had to now believe in Jesus Christ. For God so loved the world, the same way that God loved the children of Israel but was willing to discipline them, God so loved the world in that same fashion that he was only God the Son. Jesus gives this explanation of this new birth that he had referenced in verses 3 through 5 and 6 and 7 there. So let's look at now verse 16 in particular. And thinking about this new birth that Jesus talked about, the salvation that can be found through Jesus, there are a few things that I want to point out in just this one verse. And if you're taking notes, they will all start with the letter C to make it easy for us to remember. The first is going to be the cause of the new birth and salvation. What was the cause? Look at how the verse starts out in John chapter 3. For God so loved the world. There was nothing that the children of Israel in that day with Moses, there is nothing that the people could do in the first century there with Jesus and there, my friends, is nothing that you and I could ever do to earn our own salvation. There is nothing that is so great or memorable about any of us that makes us worthy of God's salvation. It is only his love for man. If you think about it, God's tremendous love for us. In 1 John chapter 4, he writes about this same love. Verses 9 and 10. And this was manifested, the love of God toward us. That word manifest, this is how it was revealed. This is how you know. This is the evidence of God's love toward us. Because that God sent his only begotten son into the world that we might live through him. Herein is love, not that we love God, but that he loved us and sent his son to be the propitiation for our sins. That's the word we studied earlier in 1 John chapter 2 a few weeks back. Jesus is a propitiation for our sins. And my friends, it was not that you and I or any person was just so great. It's because God loved us. Think about the great depths of his love. When God created the entire universe that we know that's described in the book of Genesis, those first two chapters. He created everything and he said it's good. He saw that it was made according to his liking, according to his desire. He, he created the fish of the sea, the fowl of the earth, the creeping and the crawling things, the beasts of the earth. He created man and he said it with everything it is good, but he didn't just create things. He loves us. Think about the things that you have made and created. If you've ever built a table, if you've ever built a chair, or painted a picture, or made something, it's not necessarily an object of your affection. It's just something you made. You might want to show it off to friends, but you put it away in the cabinet after a while. It ends up in a box. It's in a garage. It's in a yard sale. We don't fall in love with those things. But when God created man and breathed into man the breath of life and became a living soul, he loved the world. For God so loved the world. And that first phrase, it, it refutes so many false doctrines. It refutes atheism that said there is no God. No, there is a God. He loves the world. It refutes the false doctrine of Calvinism, that God is only a select few group of people that he loves is going to say, no, my friends, he loves the whole world. Everyone that lives and everyone that will ever live and everyone that has lived, he loves us all. It refutes deism and says God just created us and just set us out in the middle of nowhere and doesn't care about us. No, God loves the whole world. He loves the wicked and the rebellious. He loves the unbeliever. He loves the discouraged and the depressed. He loves us all. Isn't that good to know that no matter the condition or station of life where you find yourself, God loves you. He loves the man that's in the gutter living in his sin. He doesn't love the sin, but he loves the soul. He loves us all, whether you're rich or poor, whether you're from this country or that, whether you're tall or short, whether you're male or female, he loves you. There are things that separate us. And we allow to separate us. And that's why God's love is so great. We are separated by our colors. We are separated by our genders. 
We are separated by various allegiances that we have. We are separated by our social economic status. And we, we love those lines of separation so often because we can look at them or they, and they're not me, and they're not us. They separate us. But God says, you're all my children, and I love you all. That, my friends, is a tremendous depth of love. And he sees us as we really are. Oh, he doesn't see the dressed up us. He doesn't see us once we've gotten ourselves together. But while we were yet sinners, Christ died for the ungodly, for God so loved the world. That's the great cause of this new birth. In Romans chapter 6, verse 23, the Bible tells us the wages of sin is death. It is to say that if you live in sin, the payoff for that, my friends, is, is death. That's a spiritual death, not a physical death, because it's appointed for all men to die after that, the judgment. Every one of us, if the Lord doesn't return, is going to take a physical death, but we don't have to enjoy, or we don't have to experience, rather, a spiritual death. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. God offers us a gift. He offers us salvation. He offers us an opportunity to get out of the condition of sin. Why? Well, it's because he loves us. It's because he wanted us to know about his great love. Was that love just something that came up at the last minute because we were in, in a condition that was undone? No. Listen to the book of Ephesians chapter 3, beginning at verse 10. To the intent that now, unto the principalities and powers of heavenly places, might be made known by the church the manifold wisdom of God. That is to say, when the world sees the church, they see the unfolding of the multifaceted wisdom of God. That he saw, before the word was, he saw salvation in Christ through the church, through the precious blood of Jesus, according to the eternal purpose which he purposed in Christ Jesus our Lord. Friends, for God so loved the world. Before he ever said, let there be light. Before there ever was a fish in the sea and a bird in the air, before there ever was a blade of grass that grows, the Lord loved us. The Lord wanted us to be saved, and he made a way. And after we look at that first passage there, the, the cause of this new birth, it came with a cost. So often... Salvation is referred to as free, and that in a sense is true in that we don't buy it from God. We don't earn it from God. But, friends, salvation isn't cheap. It isn't like God just grabbed the, the oldest thing in the cabin that he didn't want anymore and just threw it to us. There is a cost for you and I to be saved. Look at that same passage, John chapter 3, for God so loved the world. Here's the cost that he gave his only begotten son. That is a cost for you and for me and for every soul in this world to be saved. Who is his only begotten son, by the way? Who did, who did our Lord give so that you and I can be saved? Or if we just turn the page two over in our Bibles in the book of John, we learn exactly who that was and is. What did John tell us? John said in John chapter 1, in the beginning was the Word, and the Word was with God, and the Word was God, the same was in the beginning with God. All things were made by Him, and without Him was not anything made that was made. So there is this, there is this being called the Word, who was with God in the very beginning. But who is this Word? Look at verse number 14. And the Word was made flesh and dwelt among us, and we beheld His glory as the only begotten of the Father, full of grace and truth. So the Word that was God in the beginning, that was with God in the beginning, by whom all things were made, He was made flesh. We know who that is, don't we? The only begotten of the Son of God. Who is He? Here's what John says in the, John the Baptist when he saw Him. When John the Baptist saw Him in John chapter 1, verse 29, the next day John seeth Jesus coming unto Him. He says, Behold the Lamb of God that taketh away the sins of the world. Who's the only begotten Son? Oh, He's God. He's God. That was the cost for my salvation and yours. That a member of the Godhead would have to leave heaven, be made flesh, and offered as a lamb for my salvation. My friends, salvation is not cheap. Listen to what Peter says in 1 Peter chapter 1. Excuse me, 1 Peter 
uh, chapter 1, beginning of verse 18. For as much as you know that you were not redeemed with corruptible things as silver and gold from your vain conversation received by traditions of your fathers. So he says, you and I haven't been redeemed. We haven't been bought back to God as a possession to him through silver and gold. Now, while many of us today have on some sort of jewelry, or we can see it around us, gold or silver, those are precious metals. We have our wedding rings made out of jewelry, these precious metals, because they're expensive. But my friends, God is not impressed with silver and gold. There is not enough gold in all the universe that you can buy the price of one soul. That's what Peter says. Oh, you want to redeem the God with this junk? Silver and gold is though God can be purchased? What does it take, Peter, to be redeemed to God? What does it cost for my soul? Verse 19, I know I wasn't redeemed with silver and gold, so what did it cost to buy my soul? But with the precious blood of Christ, as of a lamb without blemish and without spot, what did it take for God to show his love for me, for me to be saved? It took that one that we read about in John chapter 1, who was the word that created everything. It took that one who was with God there in the beginning and said that there be life. He did. It took that one to die on the cross for me to be saved. My friends, there is a cost of my salvation. And it wasn't mere gold or silver. Listen to the Hebrews writer in Hebrews chapter 9, beginning at verse 11, referencing the same thing. Hebrews chapter 9, beginning at verse 11, the Bible says, But Christ, being come in high priest of good things to come by a greater and more perfect tabernacle, not made with hands, that is to say, not of this building, neither by the blood of goats and of calves, but by his own blood he entered in once into the holy place, having obtained eternal redemption for us. See, it was his blood. Verse 13, for the blood of bulls and goats and the ashes of the heifer, the unclean sanctified to purify your soul, or of the flesh, rather, how much more shall the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit offered himself without spot, the spot to God, purge your conscience from dead works to serve the living God? He makes his comparison. And we've been studying the Old Testament of Leviticus and Numbers in our Sunday morning Bible class. And don't you remember how they were, they were supposed to offer these animals? Can you imagine the amount of animal blood that was shed in ancient uh, Israel? Can you imagine the amount of blood that was pouring over that altar? How many animals, innocent animals, had to be killed simply for those sins to be rolled another year back? My friends, Jesus' blood paid for, washes away the sins of the world. Says, How much more potent is that blood than the blood of bulls and goats? It could never it could never pay the price for sins. What is the cost of my salvation? Oh, it's Jesus. What did it cost Jesus himself? We know it cost God losing the second parts of the God he did. What did it cost Jesus? In John chapter 17, Jesus was praying to, to the Father. And he said in his prayer, beginning of verse 4, I am glorified thee on the earth. I finished the work which thou engaged me to do. He says to his father in heaven, I've done everything you've asked me to do to save mankind. And that was glorifying to God. He says, I finished the work that you sent me to do. Verse 5 says, And now, O Father, glorify thou me with thine own self, with the glory which I had with thee before the world was. He says, Let me be like I was with you in the beginning. Jesus was not always lowly flesh. What did it cost? Jesus, who is the Word, what did it cost him? Oh, he left heaven where there was no sadness and sorrow. He left heaven where there was no darkness and sin. He left heaven. Why? Why did he leave heaven? For me. He left a perfect environment without sin and without cold weather, without sickness, without, without any discomfort. He left that. He left everything that was perfection standing next to the other members of the Godhead, the Father, the Holy Spirit. He left that to be here because of me and for me. What did it cost Jesus? We can read of his passion, if you will, as it's often called. We can read of his, the last week of his life in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. It's referenced in the book of Acts multiple times. But I'd like to look at it in prophecy. In Psalm 22, this is a psalm that you may not know that you're familiar with, but I'm sure if you are, 
This is a psalm that Jesus references when he's on the cross. This is a psalm that starts off with this, this phrasing, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? Why art thou so far from helping me and from the words of my roaring? This is the same psalm that Jesus references. Why does Jesus reference this psalm in particular when he's on the cross? Because it demonstrates the great suffering. It demonstrates his cost. Not only did God have a cost to pay, but Jesus paid a cost to come in his world. What is the cost? Psalm 22, verse 1, we just read. Verse 7, it says, All they that see me laugh me to scorn. They shoot out the lip, they shake the head, saying, He trusted on the Lord, that he would deliver him. Let him deliver him, seeing he delighted in him. Jesus references what it cost. It cost him being ridiculed and mocked by people he came to save. In John chapter 1, we read these words. He came to his own. But his own received him not. He came to the Jews that were literally anticipating him and they rejected him. What did it cost Jesus? Shame, rejection, dismissal. Saying in this psalm, what did it cost our Lord? Verses 13 through 18. They gaped upon me with their mouths as a ravening and a roaring lion. I am poured out like water. And all my bones are out of joint. My heart is like wax. It is melted in the midst of my bowels. My strength is dried up like a potsherd, And my tongue cleaves to my jaws. That was brought me into the dust of death. For dogs have compassed me. The assembly of the wicked have enclosed me. They pierced my hands and my feet. I may tell all my bones. They look. They stare upon me. They parted my garments among them and cast lots on my vesture. What did it cost Jesus? It cost him his dignity. It cost him his safety and protection. It cost him his life. Salvation is offered freely to man, but it is not cheap. The cause of salvation was God's tremendous love. And the cost, the cost, is Jesus entire life, the cost was his, it cost him everything because he loves us. So then, as we continue to look at this passage, there is a condition of this new birth. The condition that whosoever believeth in him, whosoever believeth in him, this excludes those that do not or will not believe in him. In John chapter 8, verse 24, Jesus said, I said therefore unto you that ye shall die in your sins. For if you believe not that I am he, ye shall die in your sins. Now, if you look in your King James Bible, that word he there, if you believe not that I am he, that word he there might be italicized. This is to say the letters are a little bit slanted. You know why that is? That was added later by a copyist. That word he isn't there in the original Greek language. Jesus is saying, if you believe not that I am what does that phrase, I am, mean? You remember what God told Moses. And Moses said, who should I say has sent me? I am. Jesus is saying, in essence, if you don't believe that I am Jehovah or I am on equal things with God, then you will die of your sins. Well, if you don't believe in Jesus Christ as part of the Godhead, if you don't believe in Christ as the Son of God, if you don't believe in Christ as the only way to heaven, if you don't believe in Christ or Jesus as both Lord and Christ, then you or any person, me or any other person, will die in our sins. He, whosoever believeth in him, that pronoun in there, whosoever, we don't generally use that word anymore. I don't guess I've heard anybody say whosoever in quite a while. Do you know what that word means? It's inclusive of anybody. <laughs> if I were to say I have $100 up here for whosoever gets up and comes to get it, that includes anybody that makes the effort to come up and get it. It doesn't exclude anyone except for those that choose not to do it. Who are able to take advantage of this new birth? Who are the individuals that are able to inherit these blessings? Whosoever. <laughs> In the rich and the poor, whosoever. 
Those that have been unbelievers and, and, and ranked sinners, whosoever. Those that have previously turned their nose up at the gospel, whosoever. What if I'm 90 years old and I spent my life in sin and I finally want to give my life to Christ? Whosoever. What if I'm a young person and I want to live my whole life for Jesus? Whosoever. Whosoever believes in him. This word believe in the King James Bible often carries with it more than just mental assent. Sometimes that word believe does simply mean something that you receive and, and you acknowledge to be true. More often when we read that word in the New Testament, it carries with it a much greater meaning. The word believe in the New Testament generally carries with it the idea of not only accepting your mind, but follow through with it in action. That is to say, to obey that which we have heard. That is the general or the most common usage of that word believe. Now there are some that will say, well, that Bible verse simply says believe. And therefore, it excludes baptism. There's not one mention of baptism in John chapter 3 and verse 16. And to that I would say, I agree. There's not. But those same individuals would affirm that a person needs to repent of his or her sins. There's not one word of repent in John chapter 3 and verse 16. Does that mean we exclude it? No. There's not one word about confession in John chapter 3 and verse 16. But I don't believe that anyone would affirm that we ought not confess the name of Jesus Christ. You see, this passage is inclusive of those things. Whosoever believes in him should not perish. To believe means more than simply to hear something and have a mental assent. Let's look at what James said about this in James chapter 2, beginning at verse 18. James said, this is speaking of just belief or having faith only. James said, beginning of verse 18, Yeah, I say, or a man may say, Thou hast faith, and I have works. Show me thy faith without thy works, and I will show thee my faith by my works. Thou believest that there is one God, thou doest well. But the, the devils also believe and tremble. But wilt thou know, O, o vain man, that faith without works is dead? <laughs> James says, Listen. You can't say that you have faith and you're not doing anything <coughs> with that faith. Faith is not only mental assent, but it's equally conjoined with action. You can't say that I believe it and you're not going to do it. If your doctor tells you if you, you have to take this medication in order to live, you say, I believe you, doc. I'm just not going to take the medicine. You don't really believe it. You see, if you really believe and you want what's being promised by that doctor, you're going to do what he says. In the same way that we truly believe and want what God offers to us, going to obey what it says. James continues. He says, Was not Abraham our father justified how? By works? When he had offered Isaac his son upon the altar, seeing thou, uh, thou how faith wrought with his works, and worked together with his actions, and by works was faith made perfect. Do you hear what he said? By works is faith made perfect, incomplete. That means that if you don't have your works with your faith, it's incomplete. He continues, the scripture was fulfilled with saying Abraham believed God and was imputed to him for righteousness. And he was called the friend of God. He says the scripture was fulfilled that Abraham believed God. When was that fulfilled? Abraham believed God when? It tells us right before that. When Abraham did something about what God had told him. What did he do? He offered his son. That is when the scripture was fulfilled that he believed him. The scripture wasn't fulfilled that he believed God until he did something with his belief. In the same fashion when we read in John 3.16 that if we believe in God, it's not complete until we do something with that belief. The condition, whosoever believeth in him. Jesus said the same thing in his Sermon on the Mount in Matthew chapter, chapter 7. As he's closing out this section of teaching, the Sermon on the Mount, listen to what Jesus said about faith and how it works together with our action. Jesus said in John 7, beginning in verse 21, Not everyone that says unto me, Lord, Lord, shall enter into the kingdom of heaven. Not just saying it or, or acknowledging that he's the Lord. That's not enough. If you just say, yep, yeah, he's Lord, that's good enough for me. I'm not going to do anything with it. No. <clears throat> just know that, that that person has not enough to get to the kingdom of heaven, but he that do with the will of my Father which is in heaven. You see that? See the acknowledgement with the working? How those are equally conjoined there in that passage? 
He says, many are going to say to me in that day, you know, not be prophesied in your name, and your name cast out devils, and your name done many wonderful works. And then I profess to him unto them, I never knew you depart from me, ye that work iniquity. Therefore, whosoever hears these sayings of mine, and doeth them, them is what? The sayings of mine. Did he say do it some of them or most of them? So you do them. That includes all of them. Whoever does that, I would like it even to a wise man that built his house upon a rock, and the rains descended, and the floods came, and the winds blew, and they beat upon the house, and it fell not, for it was founded upon a rock. Jesus uses this very crude illustration of a house and storms coming so that we can understand we can stand. We can stand the same way that Paul describes standing in the book of Ephesians chapter 6, standing in victory. You see, you can't do that unless, unless you believe in him. What does it mean to believe in him? To have faith equally conjoined with our actions. The cause of this new birth in our salvation is because of God's love. The cost was Jesus' life on the cross. The condition is that we biblically believe in him. That's not where the passage ends. It says that whosoever believeth in him should not perish but have everlasting life. There is also after the condition the consequence, the outcome. Either good or bad, there's an outcome of whether or not we will believe in him. The consequence, he says, should not perish but have everlasting life. Jesus makes a statement of juxtaposition. That is to say, he puts a contrast, these two things. He wants us to see them both, but he wants us to have a, a contrast. To be able to see that there's a difference between these two ends. He says that God so loved us that he gave Jesus, and if we would believe in him, we should not perish on the one hand, but have on the other hand everlasting life. He wants us to know that there are two options. There is either the one or there is the other. Not a middle, there's not a third option, a fourth or fifth. There are two. And he wants us to see them in contrast right in this immediate context of verses. He doesn't mention the one and then say, well, I'm not going to mention the other because that's just, that's so negative and bad. I just don't want to talk about that. No, Jesus loves us so much, he's going to reveal the truth to us. And the truth shall make us free. What's the truth, Jesus? That there may be some that perish. And yet maybe others can have eternal life. Jesus taught this to those that were grieving. In John chapter 11, Jesus was at a funeral. And there were people that were heartbroken. There were two sisters in particular that were heartbroken because their brother died. I suppose that any one of us would have been the exact same as, as these two sisters. And those that were there with them, we would have been heartbroken at the loss of the family members. But Jesus wanted to teach about something greater than the loss of a physical life. He wanted to teach them to look beyond just the grave. My friends, the things that we do now are they're just so, they're so temporary. You ever see a little child and, and something happens in like third or fourth grade and their hearts are broken and you're thinking, man, you haven't even started out yet. Maybe if we remember back to our younger years, that first boy or girl that we had a crush on, and it just broke our hearts, and we thought, we, we just want to go on to glory right now. And as adults, we think, just keep living. Jesus was trying to get these two sisters to look beyond just the grave. Yes, they were heartbroken at the loss of their brother, but he wanted them to look beyond that to something greater. Listen to Jesus' words here in John chapter 11, beginning at verse 25, after Martha comes to him and she wants to know why Jesus wasn't there. In John 11, beginning at verse 25, Jesus said to her, I am the resurrection and the life. He that believeth in me, that same phrase we read over in John chapter 3, he says, he that believeth in me, though he were dead, yet shall he live. Who's he talking about? Lazarus is laying in the grave. And really by virtue of the context, all of us, any of us, whosoever. So look, if you believe in me, though you were dead, sleeping in the grave, you shall yet live. Jesus is looking beyond the grave. He continues, whosoever lives and believeth in me shall never die. So now first thing he says, this Lazarus, if he's dead, he's going to live. Don't worry about the temporary grave. Then he talks about Mary or Martha and those who are still living. He says, and whosoever liveth and believes in me shall never die. He's talking about the spiritual.
spiritual death. There's never a spiritual death for those that believe in Jesus Christ. It doesn't come to them. Then he asks her, do you believe this? Do you believe this? My friends, we just read John chapter 3 and verse 16. For God so loves the world. He gave his only begotten son. The whosoever believes in him should not perish, but ever left everlasting life. The question to you and to me, to everyone, to whosoever is, do you believe this? Do you believe it? Do you believe it to the point that you're going to do something about it? You will put faith or action equally conjoined with your mental ascent. Will you do that? This life is temporary. Who has plans for after worship today? All of us, I'm sure, no doubt, what we're going to eat or whether or not we're going to take a nap or what we're going to try to run these errands. Who has plans for next week what we're going to do? Because we're looking beyond just the moment. We know that there's something after this moment. We anticipate something after this moment. But won't we look at life that way? So many people only look at this right now. How am I going to build my life here? How am I going to feather my nest here? But Jesus is trying to get our attention. There's something after this. And if we're not prepared, if we've not already set our lives in order to believe in him now, it's going to be too late when he returns. The Lord is going to come back from heaven. The clouds are going to open up. There will be a shout from the archangel. There's going to be a trumpet that sounds. And the Lord will be here to receive those that are his. And it will be too late to say, oh, I want to believe in you now. I believe it's true now. Friends, the way we die and the way we are when the Lord returns is the way we will be in eternity. Believe us now this. In Matthew chapter 25, and we'll close with this. Jesus draws a judgment scene. He explains a judgment scene. And there are a few of these scattered throughout the scriptures, but this is one of my favorites. Because of the language that is employed and the way Jesus draws this stark contrast between these two groups of people and the two ends that they will go to meet. Beginning of verse 31, Matthew 25, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory. This is to, to demonstrate him as the, the judge, to sit on the throne of glory. Before him shall be gathered all nations, that's it, all people from everywhere. He shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divides the sheep from the goats. All nations. What about those nations that don't believe in Jesus? Oh, they'll be there. What about those groups of people that refuse to acknowledge Jesus as the Lord? Oh, they'll be there. What about those who say, oh, no, we don't want the Bible. We want this book or that. We want this holy person or that. They'll be there. Every person from every land, from every time, will stand before the judgment seat of Christ. Whether we have chosen to be there or not, we'll stand there before the judgment seat of Christ. Here's the, the, the first one, verse 33. It says, He shall set the sheep on his right hand, but the goats on the left. And, and then, um, then shall the king say to them on his right hand, those are the sheep. Those are the ones that, that metaphorically have been obedient to him. Those of his flock. He'll say to them, Come ye, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom. Listen to this phrase. Prepared for you from the foundation of the world. He says, I want you to come to a place that's prepared for you. Seems like in John chapter 14, we read about Jesus saying he's going to prepare a place for you. That's the first group. But there's also another group, the goats, that are going to be on the left. In verse 41, it says, Then shall he say to them on the left hand, Depart from me, and be cursed. Not into everlasting life, but into everlasting fire, prepared for the devil and his angels. Contrast that with what Jesus said in that first passage we just read. Come and hear the kingdom prepared for you. He made a place for you. Devil, the, the, the hell is not prepared for you. He says that hell is prepared for the devil and his angels. But some are going to go to a place that hasn't even been made up for them. Some will miss out on the place that has been prepared for them. This scene helps us to see how different the individuals and the end is for both of those. 
It's summed up very neatly in John 3.16. Should not perish, but have everlasting life. This Matthew 25 fleshes it out a little bit more. Everlasting life, eternal life, is promised for those that obey the Lord in verse 46 of Matthew 25. And, and everlasting punishment for those that disobey the Lord and have not followed him, have not believed in him. Same passage. Those two words are the exact same word in the Greek language. As long as heaven is, it's the same way that heaven will be. Without any. According to that golden text of the Bible, we don't have to go there. God so loved you, you, that he gave his only begotten son. And if you, if you don't mind my paraphrasing, but if you would believe in him, that you should not perish, that you should have eternal life. Do you believe this? If you truly believe this in the same sense the Bible uses that word believe, then in a moment we're going to sing a song that you will be able to put with your faith work. Equally conjoining those two, you will stand up and confess before witnesses that I'm a believer in Jesus Christ. I am an unashamed, unabashed believer in Jesus Christ as my Savior. And I want to be baptized into Christ today for the remission of my sins. If you believe that with all of your heart, you will do it. You'll do it. And I guarantee you this, every person in this building is waiting to embrace you and rejoice with you. We're eager. That song that we sing, that's not just the last song. That's a song of encouragement. But it could very well be the last song for one. Don't wait. Don't wait. If you need to answer the Lord's invitation today, won't you do so as together we stand and sing our song of As I the virgin's been nailed to the cross.